We were talking about uh, a few things today. Uh, actually, three pieces of software. One is a sleuth kit. The other one's autopsy uh, and cyber triage, which kind of merged them all in. So uh, sleuth kit is, uh, these are all forensics incident response tools. So uh, sleuth kit is a bunch of command line uh, and programming libraries uh, that help you kind of analyze disk images. We'll dive into this a bit more. Uh, autopsy is a, a UI. It's a platform that runs on top of sleuth kit, a bunch of other tools. Uh, it's our most popular one. Uh, we've got 11,000 downloads a month uh, on that one. And uh, the third one is cyber triage, which is an example of something that builds on top of these tools. Uh, it's actually, it's a freemium kind of uh, version of these things. Uh, but so I want to show kind of how we build on top of these things uh, in terms of extensibility. But the main theme I want to talk about here is part of this is kind of uh, the importance of extensibility uh, with these projects as we built them uh, over the years. Uh, so quick info oh, for me. Um, I've been working in security for over 20 years. Uh, I'm doing it's mostly incident response and forensics. Uh, I have some books, uh, Files of Forensic Analysis that is the most common one, uh, PhD, all that kind of stuff, and now the uh, forensics group at Basis. Uh, we're in Cambridge. Uh, we do a bunch of forensics, incident response, um, you know, security kind of stuff. So uh, these tools all started back in 2000. Uh, I was in grad school. Uh, Dan Farmer and Vita Venema were kind of uh, uh, you know, original people in the security industry released a set of tools called the Corners Toolkit. And uh, they, were using, they were building them for their, uh, a book they were doing and uh, some research things. So they're very limited in terms of what questions they need to answer uh, for their research. Uh, at the time, I was uh, starting to get involved with forensics. It was kind of a, a new area at the time and started poking around with them and you know, just start, started to build on top of them, started to expand the file systems, expand functionality, uh, and released out a uh, set of tools called TCT Utils, which is kind of the add-ons to the, the Corners Toolkit. Uh, you know, they were just very focused on what they needed for their projects. Uh, and so kind of was, it was an add-on onto their stuff. Uh, and you know, command line tools are, are kind of fun for about five minutes, uh, and then you realize that they're kind of tedious and boring. Uh, and so uh, I made a tool called Autopsy, which was, you know, is basically a poor man's uh, GUI, right? It was basically HTML. Uh, you clicked on a, a link, it ran a command line tool, it parsed the output, displayed it to you. Uh, it was a web app back in 2000 before web, web apps were cool, uh, but it wasn't very cool. Uh, it was just basic HTML, but it, it got the job done. Um, so uh, fast forward uh, a little bit, uh, I was working at Stake, which back in the day was kind of this uh, boutique security consulting firm uh, around here uh, and doing incident response and forensics for them. And back then there wasn't a whole lot of tools, right? There wasn't much incident response and forensic stuff. So we built basically what we needed for and we pushed it out. We didn't care about products back then, right? It was all just about uh, getting our stuff done and open source things with that. So um, basically that turned into the at Stake sleuth kit, uh, which was task, which later when I left there became the sleuth kit. Uh, and Autopsy evolved to kind of support uh, our incident response needs uh, as part of that effort. So this is kind of the, uh, the really poor uh, basic you know, web app back then, it's kind of minimal. Um, so that's enough of history, right? Fast forward uh, 16, 17 years, whatever it has. Uh, both of them have lived on since then, right? And taking on various forms that evolved uh, over the past 15, 16 years. Um, the Swift kit, which is, which is this underlying command line tools, library, C, C++ libraries, um, has really become a staple of analyzing disk images, right? So in the forensics process, a lot of times uh, for the dead forensics, right, what law enforcement conducts, right? You take a disk, you make a copy of it, you analyze it, you try and pull the bits and bytes out of that. Um, it's become a kind of staple for, for this. Uh, a lot of courses use it, uh, it because it's command line and very detailed. It forces you to understand all of the various nooks and crannies of a file system uh, so that when you use kind of the easier to use uh, GUI tools, uh, you actually understand what's going on behind the scenes. Um, it's actually used in a whole, inside a whole lot of other open source commercial uh, and government systems uh, as part of that. So some were mentioned this morning, uh, you know, GERM was mentioned this morning, it's in there. Um, there's a bunch of other commercial software that in includes it in just because it's, you know, it's a free open source library that allows you low level access to things. Um, but basically the takeaway is that if you want to get you know, low level things of, of common file systems, NTFS, FAT, XFAT, smartphones, uh, Android, iOS, right, it basically allows you to analyze, analyze those, those file systems pull data out uh, and access it without kind of tampering with things and, and having to know about a whole bunch of gory details about file systems. Um, SleuthKit over the years uh, took on kind of a, uh, you know, a, a different role, if you will. Uh, it kind of lagged, right? It, 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 the first versions were very just Linux and Mac based because we built what we needed to uh, you know, for that. Uh, we, we started organizing a conference uh, and so in 2010 we held the first OSDF con. Uh, which is in DC, it's a conference all dedicated to open source digital forensics uh, software. Um, I have some info at the end of it. But essentially that, that first year we had this, uh, one of the main takeaways from this were 
people wanted different forensics tools that were uh, more platform based, that was easier to uh, have plugin modules for and not rely on six or 10 different tools to copy data around. Uh, so we, we left this conference, uh, we started building it, uh, and basically we, we, we kind of you know, reborn, uh, we, we rebirthed the autopsy, if you will, after that, of being a different focus, right? Really focusing on uh, ease of use uh, and, and availability, extensibility uh, in plugin modules for that. Uh, just because so much of the users were on Windows uh, and not on Linux and Mac. Even though we were happy on Linux and Mac, uh, most other users weren't. Uh, so that. So this is a screenshot for that. It's probably hard to see in, the, in these lights. Um, nothing fancy, honestly, right? There's basically just kind of the, the, the tree on the left, the table, and the details on the bottom. Um, but the main idea was actually the ease of use is important. Uh, one of our, we, we got some funding along the way to build all these things. And one of our early on funding actually was the Army. Uh, and their use case was uh, they have a piece of media seized in the field, uh, they have two hours. Uh, and this person is just your average soldier. They're not a forensics person, they're not even a computer techie person. Right? How do you make easy software for them that in two hours they can decide, right, keep it or let it behind or whatever. So that, that whole kind of mindset really evolved a lot of what we built uh, as part of these things. So it's, it's simple, right? It's, it's a tree, it's a table, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a GUI on the bottom. But these ideas aren't that uncommon, right? A lot of companies have people kind of doing incident response and forensics uh, as kind of one person who kind of evolves into that role uh, as, they, as they get more into response versus just prevention uh, and detection. So these main ideas and themes have come a long way as part of that. Um, for those who, who are developers and care to hear more about what we mean by extensibility, um, we've got about five or six different kind of uh, frameworks and extension points uh, in the software, but the most popular one people write are called ingest modules. And the basic idea is that uh, you take your disk image uh, that comes in the system uh, and we make pipelines. And so that line at the top there is basically every file in the system will go down this pipeline at some point. And we ship with a whole bunch of modules. So for example, the first one makes the MD5 or SHA-1 hash of the file. The second module looks that up and says, are you a known you know, Microsoft file or Adobe file or something I can ignore? Or you know, are you a known bad file that we should flag? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And essentially you can make a module yourself that drops in there. Uh, and it's pretty easy. All, all your module does is we're going to pass you in a file and you decide what to do with it. And if you want to flag it and do various things, we have some easy APIs uh, and it pops up in the UI for the users to see it and, and get some information. So essentially we, we hide the details for the users of you don't care if it's coming in from an NTFS file system or an iPhone. Uh, you don't care if it's coming from unallocated space or, a, or inside a zip file. We hide all this stuff for you and we make the UI for you. All you have to do is basically make some simple uh, modules in there, do some analytics and flag some things for that. Um, so the impact of kind of focusing more on ease of use uh, and this extensibility is uh, you know, far more users than ever, right? We have about 11,000 downloads at least per month uh, of our releases as part of this. Um, you know, and we now have a business basically building features and modules, right? So we, we build custom software for people. Uh, we make custom versions of this for if you're in a situation where you have 30 minutes with it, you can plug a thing in, uh, analyze things, and we can basically tailor the pipeline for you uh, as part of that. And fortunately, we have a bunch of customers who let us release it, release it back out as open source. So a lot of stuff we build for them. Uh, some stuff stays behind their kind of proprietary curtain. A whole bunch of other stuff gets pushed out uh, in the open source community. So people always ask, like, how do you actually make money off open source software? Uh, in this case, right, people are paying us to build stuff, uh, and they're letting the whole community kind of benefit uh, you know, from having this kind of functionality in there. Um, because of that, we now have a bunch of features that you can't find uh, actually in commercial tools. So we have things like uh, multi-user collaboration where most forensics tools are very desktop focused, right? You have your one disk image, you bring in your desktop, you analyze it, uh, and if you have several of you working on the same case, uh, you all work independently, and in the end, you all merge it together at the end. It's very inefficient. Uh, so with Autopsy now, you can have multi-user cases where you have a central server and messaging going on, uh, you can tag things and your colleagues can see it, uh, and you can really kind of do much more efficient investigations uh, as part of that. We can do cross-link analysis, timelines, whole bunch of stuff. Actually, Nick, where'd Nick go? Nick's in the audience here. Uh, he was an intern with us a long time ago uh, and actually made one of the first versions of our timelines, so I uh, have, some, have some history there. Um, but the main idea with all these things is that this extensibility you know, kind of has made these tools fairly popular, right? The Sleuth Kit uh, has this really great uh, library API. It's, I can't take any credit for it. Uh, this all came out of the original Corners Toolkit design. But because of this API design, uh, it's made it easy to incorporate into a bunch of other tools out there, uh, whether they're commercial or, or open source or proprietary. Um, Autopsy 3's got a bunch of success because of its ease of use uh, in modular designs, right? We can customize it, other folks write modules for it. Um, you know, we have, we have a competition every year. We had 22 submissions, I think, last year for our, our Python modules as part of that. So it's becoming more of that platform people write for uh, instead of writing their own kind of standalone tools uh, for all these things. 
So to kind of show an example of, of how we kind of built on top of all these things, uh, so we have a tool called Cyber Triage. Uh, this is a, it's not, it's not, it's kind of open source, not not fully open source, um, but kind of following on a bunch of these themes that are, that are coming today, right? Is incident response, right? What do you do, uh, you know, with a computer when you have an alert and you're trying to investigate things? So the problem we tried to solve with Cyber Triage was much like uh, the people we build uh, forensic software for, we have kind of untrained people doing these things. Uh, a lot of companies experience this process of they try and prevent everything, they realize they can't, right? They buy detection system, uh, they now get alerts, right? They have SIM alerts, they have network IDS alerts, uh, and then they say, they say, now what, right? Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of companies rely on antivirus, right? They basically say, well, antivirus was happy last night. It didn't, it didn't raise any alarms. It must be a false positive. And the basic idea of cyber triage was, how do we give companies uh, a better capability of investigating that endpoint uh, without being forensics IR uh, experts, right? And tools like OS Query are great. They're really powerful. You can do these crazy queries, uh, but your average company actually isn't going to know how to use you know, all those kind of things. They want a basic, much more level of, you know, is this compromised, and should I wipe it, or call on outside people? Uh, and that was kind of the goal of cyber triage, right? So it's kind of a mini forensic investigation you know, of that, focusing on kind of automation ease of use to let your average company kind of use this, uh, as well as being agentless to make it easy to deploy. So they don't have to have the agents running kind of on all endpoints at all times. So here's a basic screenshot of that, a basic kind of dashboard. Uh, it collects data, does some analytics on it, flags suspicious things, uh, and kind of guides the user through what to kind of uh, look for as part of that. So how do we use uh, our open source stuff? So um, our, our collection tool, it's a single executable uh, that gets pushed out as needed uh, to the endpoint to pull back files and data uh, so that we can analyze as part of that. Uh, because we're agentless, we had to have it all kind of embedded into a single executable uh, to make it easy to move around uh, as part of that. So um, the Sleuth Kit is used to actually you know, do all that analysis. So when we have our collection tool go out, the Sleuth Kit is the one that actually accesses the Windows data at the, at the lowest levels, the raw you know, binary devices for that. We parse the file systems, we parse the registries uh, as part of that because we don't want to rely on the Windows API, which could lie to us, right? There could be rootkits and things on that's going to lie to us. So uh, by using the Sleuth Kit, we can bypass locked files, right? If you just try to go in and copy the registry high or event log, uh, Windows will probably yell at you because it's, it's actually a locked file uh, that's being used by the system. So we bypass all of that with the SleuthKit, and we can pull that back uh, as part of that. We also scan the system now, looking for suspicious files, uh, and we're bypassing the rootkits because we're going through and doing our own parsing of the file systems. Is a rootkit basically saying, hey, hide this folder, because uh, it's got all of our good stuff in there. Uh, we still see it, because we're actually going through and doing all those things. So by having this kind of low level access with the SleuthKit, we can go through and access things that we couldn't normally just by using normal kind of Windows uh, APIs as part of that. Uh, also as part of this, we had to kind of analyze the registry. Right? We're trying to do everything without modifying, writing a disk uh, as part of these things. So we want to kind of read the registry hive into memory, parse it, because we're going to go through and looking for the three or four dozen startup places uh, that are used as part of startup, where malware kind of likes to put itself into uh, as part of that collection. <coughs> so. Um, we do everything in C++, right? This is kind of ancient now. A uh, few people use actually C++ these days. But uh, we ported uh, Willie Ballantine's uh, Python library. He, he's, uh, he's not fire, right? He wasn't Mandiant. I guess it's still Mandiant. But he has a bunch of Python uh, libraries to actually analyze registry hives uh, in Python. So we ported that to C++, uh, and it's now part of the uh, SleuthKit as a registry++. As part of that, with the basic idea being that you can use SleuthKit, uh, you know, access these hives that are locked, uh, and then basically analyze them in memory with those kind of APIs without having to write things to disk and you rely on a lot of software as part of that, but still embed it into the single executable to make it easy to move around. Um, and then the autopsy usage in here is that the first version of cyber triage uh, actually were autopsy modules, right? So we have all these frameworks and various extension points in there. Uh, and the first version of cyber triage were autopsy modules. Uh, and we chose that because it's, it's, a, it's that good starting, easy to use kind of framework uh, as part of that for analyzing systems that are alive or dead uh, as part of that. Um, over time, they kind of went separate ways. Um, you know, autopsy is much more, or uh, search is not much more about live analysis and correlation and back-end databases and, and live collections. Um, so they're kind of now gone different ways. But the, uh, the difference now is that, you know, the, the use case and the integration now is that autopsy can be used for that deep dive analysis, right? So cyber triage is used for, you have an alert, uh, you have an alert about endpoint, you investigate that, you pull data back, uh, you go through the data, you make a decision of, this is boring, I'm gonna move on, I'm gonna wipe the system and move on, uh, or this is actually interesting, I wanna do a deeper dive to figure out kind of the root cause analysis and the who, what, where, why, and whens. 
and Autopsy basically pulls that data in now, and it can leverage that cyber triage database, uh, and you can get that d data about how common or how rare a file is. Uh, you're not just analyzing that in, that in isolation, and you can kind of leverage both that triage capability uh, as well as that deep dive capability. Um, OSDFCon, I mentioned this before, this is our annual conference. We're having the eighth one uh, this year. Uh, it's always in the DC area. Um, this is October 17th. Uh, we get about over 400 people that come every year uh, as part of this. You know, a lot of them are, are federal people in the DC area. Um, previous talks, a uh, bunch of tools mentioned here uh, as well. We've had the original developers who go and talk to it. So Google is there every year. They give two or three talks uh, about GER and other things that have been mentioned here today as well. Uh, Facebook was there last year. Uh, the developers were there talking about OS Query uh, as well. Netflix was there with Fido, a whole bunch of others. It's basically one day intensive 30 minute talks uh, with the developers themselves. You kind of get to meet uh, all the original developers themselves. <coughs> uh, if you're there, I heard there's a bunch of students in the audience. Uh, if you want cash, uh, every year we have an autopsy uh, competition. So you can write uh, Python modules for autopsy. Uh, if you win, you get, uh, I think it's $1,500 for the first prize, uh, 1000 I think, for second prize. Uh, guys kind of goes down from there. Uh, we're a very crowdsource based approach. So the presentations are all based on uh, the internet voting. So basically, people submit talks. Uh, the talks are due June 1st. Uh, people vote on social media and various things. Uh, that, that makes the agenda. And as well as modules. Uh, the module submitters have little time slots in the conference. Uh, and basically, the audience gets to vote on which module they like the best and the, the winner gets forward that way. So a uh, quick summary. Uh, if you need tools that are low level disk analysis, the so low level file systems, recovering files, uh, try the sleuth kit. If you're looking at dead box analysis of hard drives and cell phones, uh, autopsy is tool, the tools for you. Uh, and if you want kind of the mini forensic investigation uh, you know, of a live endpoint, uh, then cyber triage is your, uh, is your bet for that. So these are the uh, URLs for, uh, for those tools. So questions? Why well, is it hard to untag it? Uh, well, you can't just like right click on it, delete it. No? Yeah. <laughs> from the uh, tags bottom? Oh, you mean from the item itself? No, from the actual. So in, 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 in the tags item in the tree, there should be a right click option to delete tag uh, from there. And I believe uh, the next release actually allows you to untag it as well from the actual item itself. So if you're in a file, from the file menu, you can untag it from there as well. Uh, and that release will be out tomorrow, I think, is the uh, current ETA. It's supposed to be today, but thanks tomorrow. So, so. Cool, thanks.